Hi guys, good to see everyone and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I do apologize for not being able to meet you guys in person uh, due to the COVID-19 situation. But of course, you know, I figured it's best to be safe, right? You know, let's do our part, stay home and stay safe. And since you guys are staying at home, I figured let's do this in the comfort of my own house. Uh, so welcome to my humble little home. Okay, I've got this uh, very interesting talk lined up for you guys. Basically, I'm going to show you some of the pictures that I've done and I explain to you um, how some of these images that you guys are familiar with are actually captured. But before that happens, I think it's very important for me to explain my roots. Right? Uh, I think most, most of you guys know me as an underwater photographer, but I think it's also very important to note that I am actually a commercial photographer by trade. Now, that's what I do for a living. That's what pays for the bills. So basically, what is commercial photography? Basically, I have a studio in Singapore. That's where I work every day. Um, and I basically started my career uh, 20 plus years ago uh, shooting fashion, believe it or not. Um, so I work with a lot of models um, and uh, shoot for a lot of fashion magazines and covers. And if you look at some of these early pictures, right? I mean, you can tell that a lot of my work is very based on contrast and strong punchy colors. Um, and I've, uh, I've been a big fan of uh, this photographer called David LaChapelle back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And you know, his stuff is pretty much like that and it inspires me a lot because you know, I just love all these colours. Um, so these are the stuff that I do um, for my studio. Uh, and I still shoot a lot like this as well and things like that, um, magazine covers. And of course, you know, over the years I moved on to a lot of advertising work, you know, things with Scuba Pro and all that. In 2006, I started this project called Watercolors as well. Um, and it's basically, you know, me bringing my world of fashion photography into the underwater world. Uh, and bear in mind guys, this was in 2006. So we did a lot of fun stuff, you know, things like that. Um, at the same time, you know, again, you can see the colors, you can see the contrast that has kind of, you know, influenced my underwater photography as well, you know. A lot of this stuff. Again, this shot full of colors. And of course, there are some advertising stuff that I did as well for Scuba Pro. You might have seen this before and things like that. And in uh, 2011, I believe, uh, I published my first book called Watercolors, which is a bunch of, you know, the images that you saw just now. So that is what I do for a living, right? That's my job. So when we come to underwater photography itself, you know, marine, um, I think, you know, because of my training as a commercial photographer, a lot of the stuff and the ideas that we do in the studio, I kind of, you know, kind of have influenced my approach to underwater photography. And one of the key things that I do is, um, you know, we will always sketch stuff in the studio. So we will always have visuals, we will always have mood boards. Um, basically, you know, just pieces of paper to tell people the ideas that you have. So when it came to underwater photography, you know, I subconsciously decided, you know, I'm going to do that as well, which I think is kind of unique uh, for an underwater photographer. So. To show you an example, I'm going to bring you guys to Fakarava in French Polynesia. Yes, that is a name. Okay, I didn't make that shit up. So it's a real name, real place. This place called Fakarava, very famous for its sharks. And I was there a um, couple of years back to do a shoot for Blanc Pound. And um, while I was on the way there on the plane, I you know had some ideas that I wanted to shoot and I actually sketched it in a notepad. And here you see one of the original sketches that I did. Um, you know, basically, of course, it's the watch, right? You know, I wanted to showcase the watch and I wanted to show the sunburst and the free divers swimming up towards the sunburst. And this is the actual sketch itself. And here is the uh, final shot. You know, again, you know, that's the way I work, right? Because in, in the studio, it's always good to be able to tell your team exactly the stuff that you want to achieve. And the best way to do that, I feel really, is to, you know, sketch. You know, however simple the sketch may be, it might just be a couple of stick man drawing a couple of lines but it's very important to show your team you know the vision of what you want to achieve and especially you know something like this you're working with a free diver um, you want to be able to communicate with them and so that everybody's on the same page of what you want to achieve here's another one um, again he's swimming up towards the surface uh, you can see the brand blanc pan and then you know the sunburst and here's the shot which actually finally ended up as one of the advertisements um, for blanc pan and you can see it, you know, all over the world. This is in one of the airports in France. And, you know, this idea of sketching, you know, the ideas and the visuals before you shoot, 
actually became an interesting topic for a lot of photographers. So uh, it was actually featured in Utawasa uh, a couple of years back. And you know, they just basically showcased, you know, how I would draw everything up before I shot, which again, I feel that, you know, perhaps from an underwater perspective, it's kind of, interest, kind of interesting. But again, I'll say this is what we do in the studio all the time, right? And uh, since we are in Fakarava, uh, you know, I've just spent some time talking to you about this beautiful place. Now, basically, what's so magical about Fakarava is that there's this place called the South Pass in Fakarava. And every July, uh, there's this congregation of uh, groupers and they basically hang around because it's uh, to spawn, right? Uh, and when they show up, you know, we're talking about tens of thousands of groupers. And when this amount of food shows up, predators comes along. And predators meaning sharks, right? You have tens of thousands of sharks that would congregate as well uh, in sync with the spawning of these groupers. And that's where you get that famous uh, wall of sharks that uh, this Fakarava South Pass is famous for. And you know, again, this ended up as one of the advertisements for Blancpain. So if you go to the boutiques now or you chase a watch, you will see this image. Uh, in the package. Pretty cool. Um, the second story that I want to bring you guys to is the Mayan skull. Now, um, I think I, it was a good 10 years ago, I you know, was to do a cover for Scuba Diver Australasia and I was on my way to Mexico. Now, um, if you guys are familiar, there's a lot of very, very cool cenotes in Mexico. Now, um, for the friends who are not very familiar with that, these are basically underwater caves, right? Uh, gin clear water, super good visibility, and you have you know the sunlight coming in through the canopies, you know, creating all these very magical light shows. Um, and we were there to show a cover because I have found out that uh, there were these Mayan remains, you know, these Mayan skulls that are uh, in some of these cenotes. You know, so you know, off we went. Um, and just to give you guys an example of you know an idea for the friends who have not been or not familiar with cenotes, I mean it's things like that, right? super clear waters, very nice caves, sunlight coming in. I mean, it's just a beautiful place to make pictures, to be honest. Um, stuff like that. Very, very beautiful. And again, you know, just as I've uh, shared with you guys before, I did a very rough sketch and I showed this to my editor at the time, Scuba Diver Australasia editor, uh, Diego Garcia. And he thought, oh, this is a cool idea. If you can locate a skull like this, I thought it'd be cool to shoot it, you know, in front of the frame, really wide angle close-ups. And then you have a diver all the way in the back um, with another light behind the diver to you know make a silhouette out of the diver and yada 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 i was, I was very inspired by um, actually one of the shots by david dublier because i think he did something very similar in the turtle tomb in sipadan and i thought wouldn't it be cool if we did it with a mayan skull so off we went uh did some research uh, got some fixes on over in mexico to locate uh, one of these skulls and uh, basically it was just uh, about the Two hours drive i believe for some dirt track and we ended up at the end of the road where we had to you know unload all our gear and we had to track in the forest uh, for i think it was a good you know another almost a mile into the forest and you end up literally in it to uh, a hole in the ground right and it's basically a small little hole and you will have to repel about 20 meters down and then as you go in it's not a tunnel it, once you pass the uh, the ground level it basically opens up and you realize that it's a big cavern and now all of a sudden you realize that the ground that you're standing on is actually not ground because right under you, underneath you is actually a body of water 20 25 meters down and um, basically you repel down and you have to you know send your equipment in and the thing is um in this little cenote there are a lot of remains you have animal remains and i believe this is a mouse deer um, that's what i was told but you have all kinds of bones and sediments from you know the forest above and uh, as we descended a little bit further, uh, that's where we located some of the skulls. Now, uh, again, I don't know if you guys know about the Mayan culture. I mean, if you watch the movie Apocalypto, uh, these are basically a bunch of guys who, you know, they were sacrificed people, right? And they would throw some of these sacrificial remains into the cenotes. And um, this is how this guy ended up there. So I think, you know, I mean, they are about 300-ish plus years old. Um, and you can see there's one skull here and there's another skull right beside it uh, and this is one of the first shots that was fired because you know it's extremely difficult to shoot in this environment because it is an enclosed body of water there's no current right and you have very very fine sediment at the bottom 
uh, it could be leaf from a hundred years or thousands of years of leaf sediment, um, you know, rotting stuff that's in the water that has settled. Now think of it as a tissue paper that you will beat up in water. Or you leave it overnight, it sinks. But the slightest turbulence will disturb the sediment. And, it, and even if you lift your hand up at this speed, you will cause little you know, turbulence that will bring up all this sediment. And the thing with cenotes is that there's no current. So what happens is this sediment will stay in this column of water. And you know, then your shot is pretty you know, done. Right, so we had to be super, super careful because the slightest mistake, end of the story, right? So that one, this is the first shot, you know, and then we moved on to another shot, you know, and you can see in the background, there's a torch and that's the, that's the model, right? That's where he's supposed to be. And if you see right behind him, there's another small light. Um, that's my assistant trying to fix the light that's supposed to be behind the, the, the model. To, to create that silhouette. So it was very difficult because this is pitch dark, guys. And I mean, like, you can't see anything. So to communicate in this tight environment, you know, pitch dark, you're not supposed to stir anything up. Um, pretty intense. All right, so this is one of the fourth or fifth shot I remember that we took. Looks pretty cool already, but, you know, I just felt that the um, model is not in the right position. You know, the light is not right in the back. And each time I shot, I had to wait I had to wait for the model to exhale because I wanted to capture the bubbles as it rises. Because without the bubbles, honestly speaking, it doesn't even look like it's underwater, right? So I, you know, I just wanted to make sure I had that underwater element in the shot. So each time he exhales, boop, one shot. And finally I got it. So this ended up as the cover of Scuba Diver Australasia. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of effort put to do it. Uh, it's not a, by the way, you know, we, we shot it because we saw it. Uh, everything was planned, there's a lot of effort put into it, getting the model, getting the guys, the assistant and the crew to bring everything in, which is very much like commercial photography to me, right? That's why we plan these things. And just so that you get an understanding of how bad the um, sediments and all the uh, dirt are, I'll show you, right after this cover was taken, the next shot was this. Right? So basically this, when I lifted my camera a little bit to change the position, and you know, it just all went to hell. Um, so that was how close we got to not getting the shot. Um, so that was this, the Mayan skull. Now the third place that I'm going to share is this thing called light stacking. And for that, I will bring you guys to Truck Lagoon and Saipan. Uh, if you guys are familiar with Truck Lagoon, it is basically the, I would say the World War II Japanese wreck diving capital of the world, right? Um, they basically have a a lot of wrecks within a very small area and um, before we go there I want to explain to you what light stacking is now I kind of uh, I would say I would love to say I invented it um, the term light stacking um, it, but the thing is I gotta be honest with you it's not new to photography we do this in um, the studio all the time we do this in interior shots all the time so basically what is light stacking uh, is basically a camera in a fixed position on a tripod, taking the same picture many times, um, but with different lighting angles, right? And once that is done, uh, we basically stack them, okay, together in post-production, and we come up with a final image. Um, again, these things uh, are not new. We do this all the time for interior shots and interior photography. Um, but the thing is, very few people that I know of, at least, uh, at least when these were done, um, that we brought this underwater. I don't think I know of anybody at the time who did it underwater. So yeah, I thought it was just a fun idea to try out. So obviously the best thing to do is to get a subject that will never move. And you know, as far as we are concerned, the shipwreck does not move. So, you know, off we went to Truck Lagoon and to Saipan where there's a lot of these wrecks. And, you know, I want to show you basically um, how the setup looks like. So here is the camera um, on a tripod. Right, uh, the legs are extendable. I mean, it's basically an arm, right? Photography, a stroke arm. Uh, you can basically, you know, if you have longer ones, you can do whatever you want. And it's quite a sturdy rig. So basically, lights are on the camera. And um, at that time, I think this was maybe seven or eight years ago when this was done. Um, we actually had Seacam custom for me a um, customized SYNC cord. So we had 10 meter SYNC cords that we could connect. 
that we could connect together and make it 20 meters, 30 meters, you know, as long as we wanted. And this was great because um, it was very difficult to trigger strobes uh, in a bright environment at the time at least. And you know, without this sync call, I think it would be very difficult to achieve. So basically had the rig um, and then we had this long sync quads and did some research on what we wanted to shoot. And this happens to be one of the uh, Japanese tanks that are still mounted uh, on the top deck of one of the vessels. Um, and here you see one of the first shot. You can see the, the sync cord, right? The really long sync cord. And the assistant is holding this light and this lighting up this portion of the tank, right? And that's one shot. And then you have, you know, you can see here is a composite of a lot of shots. This, these are all, these are all the same uh, assistants, right? Basically, he's just in different position and the camera is just clicking away at the exact same spot with different spot of lights, right? So once that is all done, uh, it comes together to form this very, very unique um, final image. You know, it created this very cool and interesting kind of look that, you know, it's not something you see in an underwater shot of a wreck all the time. I mean, I, I'm looking at this thing now, you know, seven, eight years down the road and I still think it's pretty cool. So uh, here's another one. It's one of the guns that are also on the top deck. Um, and you can see again, you know, all the different spots. Again, this is the same assistant, just, you know, the same shot done several times. And the final image, very polished. Uh, it looks very perfect. You know, it's just a unique way of looking at wrecks, to be honest. Um, and this one, this is a little bit more challenging because this is in one of the engine rooms. So you're working in a much smaller, confined space than you would on the top deck. Uh, again, you know, there's a lot of sediments in here. So it's very important that, you know, the entire crew, assistants, myself, um, really pay attention not to stir up some of this stuff. Uh, this again is the shot that is consisting of all the lighting position and that's the final. And now we go to Saipan. Uh, this is a pretty famous dive site in Saipan. It's one of the propellers. Uh, you can see, you know, I'm thinking, you know, there's a silhouette of one of the divers in the back. And, you know, this is the angle of the sun, you know, and this is the camera. And, you know, this is all the lighting spots, you know, which I want to achieve. And here is one of the first shot, you know, just lighting the propeller and then the top part of the propeller and then the model comes in the back. So again, you know, it's just this very polished look that is really, really cool. So that one is in Saipan. And here, still in Saipan, uh, this is a Sherman tank, right? Uh, so basically it's sitting in a lagoon, you know, during high tide, you know, you see the top of it a little bit breaking the surface, but during the lower tide or mid tide, you can actually see the gun, right? The turret is up there above water. And so um, we basically had to mount the camera on a makeshift stick because we didn't have a tripod that was tall enough at the time. Uh, and we waited for the tide to submerge a little bit. So the camera is like half in and out of water and uh, managed to capture this very cool shot. And since we are in Saipan, let's go to another part of Saipan. Now this one is a little bit crazy. There's this dive site called uh, the Grotto in, in Saipan. And what it is, is basically a hole in the ground, right? A big cabin uh, and to get there you have I think something like some crazy 120 steps down now going down is fine okay but you must remember you must get back up so you know this whole thing is just tough because we had our tanks uh, you basically need to bring everything you will need for the dive and once you get there um, you know uh, you have to go past this crazy you know I think maybe we just had a bad day uh, the search was pretty crazy and intense and you actually had to walk through all this really strong current to get onto this rock here and once you get onto this rock, um, like that, uh, you basically jump in from the side. Uh, it's, so it's like a giant, giant strike, okay, into this uh, 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 Goroto. And, but once you get in there, underwater is really calm. And again, crystal clear, right? Very good visibility. And it's a very beautiful little cave. Um, and here's one of the shots, you know, lighting the rocks here. And then another one, another part of the cave exactly in the same position and the diver, the silhouette of the diver and you have that final composite which is again, you know, very, very cool uh, uh, image of the Goroto. So that was uh, light stacking uh, over in Truck Lagoon and Saipan. Now uh, moving on to the next one and the last uh, topic that I want to share with you is of course 
the art of light, which is what this is all about, right? Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed from all the pictures I've shown you before just now, um, if you pay attention, it's actually always very contrasty. It always has a lot of punchy colors um, and it's always got a lot of shadows. Like some people even call my images a little bit too dark for their liking. Um, but all this is just my personal style. And now I want to share with you the last thing, which is composition, right? That kind of puts everything together and makes it all work. Um, for that, I will show you, you know, now I'm going to show you images from all over the world, right? This is the first shot, which I like a lot. Um, this is a uh, saltwater Cuban crocodile uh, that we did in Cuba, obviously, right? But what makes this shot interesting is that, you know, you see a lot of images of crocodiles, you know, people going really, really close, right up to the teeth and all that. I mean, those are cool, don't get me wrong. But, you know, sometimes I think it is also very important to show the environment, you know, using the background and the home of this animal to kind of frame it up to make it interesting. So things like that, you know, um, obviously the thing that is interesting about this shot is the reflection of the crocodile. And, you know, things like that as well. This is one of my favourite shots that came out of the entire trip. Not because it is so upfront to the, to the crocodile, but precisely because it is not. Now, um, I think it takes a bit of discipline to capture images like that. So what this actually does is, it's not dead centre, it's slightly off centre a little bit. You see the entire crocodile and his body position looks almost like he's taking a step forward, which he actually was. But the cool thing is it actually also shows the environment in which the animal lives. And you know, because this was a shot on a fish eye, um, it created this warp, right? It's just physics. But you know, it kind of makes the entire image interesting because you have this wide open space and all of a sudden this small little crocodile, well not small actually, but he's so small in frame that kind of if you blink, you kind of miss him. You know, but that's the point, right? Because the crocodile is a very stealthy uh, uh, animal, predator, right? So it just to show how well he blends into his environment. But of course, uh, you know, I have all these close-up shots of teeth as well, if you guys like to see. But again, what makes this image works is because of the contrast, right? This big animal with all these huge teeth against a black backdrop. And you know, so this is where the contrast is, where it makes it pop. Um, and this are the stuff I like doing. But, you know, and of course, if you are going to take pictures with a crocodile, you know, you might as well get some pictures of you with the crocodile uh, just for bragging rights, right? So if you think this was a big crocodile, wait till you meet the daddy. This is Godzilla. Um, and uh, I know you shouldn't be touching crocodiles and all that, uh, but he was just there. So, yeah. And you know, another <laughs> cool image I want to share with you guys. Uh, uh, this is the boat that we live on and you know the smart ones are all the ones in the picture on the boat having a beer the stupid one is the one taking this image which is me right so again you know i question my choices in life all the time um, and since we're talking about big teeth uh, here's more teeth basically now we're still in cuba uh, sharks right um, and you know this is one of again those classic images very clean um, this white border here is basically the benetting. You know how you slide it to one side and it becomes all dark, which is what most people do. But you know, whoever says it has to be that way. So basically what I did is uh, I slided it way to the other extreme and now you have this white border which turns out pretty cool, right? And um, it's very clean, it's got good separation and it's got contrast. And of course, you can also shoot shots like that. Again, we are talking about contrast against the blacks. Um, and you know, this just happened, this is in Fiji, I believe. Yeah, it's in Fiji. So the bull sharks will come out from uh, between the schools of uh, uh, fishes. And as and when they come as the fish parts, you know, then that's where your moment is. Um, and of course, this is not shot at night. This is actually in the daytime. But the strokes are just set at such a high power and the exposure is so fast that, you know, the ambient light is basically cut out of it. So um, it, it looks dark because of, you know, the settings. And, you know, again, contrast, storytelling, composition, colors. Look at this, blue against the green. And, you know, it tells the story of this uh, baby turtle that I got to shoot in Wakatobi uh, during his first swim. Very cool. Again, using contrast to separate an image. This is in Shirutoko in Japan, under the ice. Uh, again, this is, I think, ten, more than 10 years ago and we had this crazy idea of shooting free divers under ice uh, and, you know, I figured 
the best way to do this is to show the environment because you know the star here isn't the free diver being in the water the star here are the ice right the ice fields and uh and and you know this free diver is just a small little subject within this vast space uh, and so the framing is like that um, and we did some with uh, one of the divers as well again you're just showing the scale of the place right how big and massive these ice blocks are um, and you know sometimes composition is also about you know perspectives it's like how you how you display and, and showcase your work so this is just basically the same stuff just flipped around um, and you know it makes for a very interesting picture I mean you will look at it and go like mm, how does this work and then you realize after a while you know so it kind of engages the audience as well and again if you're going to do crazy stuff you might as well get some pictures of yourself doing it all right and um and you know all this contrast and, and, and uh, lighting and, and shadows and and colors does not only apply to wide angle i know i've been showing wide angle all the time but also very much in macro right so helicon strip like that you can see all the textures it's very different from you putting two lights by the side of the camera and just blasting away um, basically you know these are lightings that come in from the sides and because of that it creates the textures and the contrast that makes this entire image you know different and another good example would be this this is one of my favorite uh, uh, this is actually just a common goby on the sponge now i've always said you know a good picture of the most common subject beats an okay picture of the rarest species anytime so it, it, it does not have to be a rare animal i mean if you can shoot an a fantastic shot of your neighbor's cat i think it will it will beat somebody shooting a lion any other time you know because the whole idea is in photography and you know lighting is what makes it possible for us to take something that is so simple like a goby on a sponge and kind of makes it so unique uh, and nice and this shot has nothing else in it but good lighting so you gotta think about all those few things contrast think about the shadows think about the colors and of course composition which kind of exists in this entire frame you know you have Roby, obviously red versus green not center frame a little bit to the side and then you have all these dark areas which creates all these contrast so um, then in all these pictures were put together I think this was in 2003 uh, into my second book called The Blue Within and uh, so it was a great pleasure and fun to put it together and I know some of you guys might have seen it um, but basically it documents uh, 10 years of my diving uh, adventures and um, if you guys want a copy of this uh, give me a shout and uh, we'll try to arrange something I'm not selling books here but just in case you're interested with that i come to the end of my very short uh, presentation for you guys i uh, hope you guys like it uh, again you know i really do apologize for not being there in person um, but you know these are really strange times and i think it's important that we all play our part i think it's the least we can do so with that said um, please stay safe stay positive and more importantly stay home if you can right? it's just for a little while i'll catch you guys soon hopefully somewhere um, out in the sea maybe in the next year hopefully i can come visit you guys as soon as i can cheers guys